Now, this fella right here, that fella right there, is a good looking guy. That's Daniel Mark Schwartz. He's actually the author of Off Grid Permaculture. So he looks at things from a different perspective. He's also like a quantum physicist. So, so I mean, he's one of the smartest guys I know. <laughs> so, and, he, and he's a life coach. So welcome with me, Mr. Daniel Mark Schwartz. Thank you, Dave. Um, so. As he said, I'm uh, Daniel Mark Schwartz, author of Off-Grid Permaculture, and I am somebody that really loves to talk about what people do for a living, how, um, we, you know, how we make a mark on the world, and when it comes to life coaching, I find that to be the single most important thing that you can do when you start with a client is to uh, excuse me, facilitate them developing a life purpose. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about here today. This is uh, about a 30, 35 minute talk, and I'm going to be going over why you would want to start with them, both in the sense where you know why it makes sense to start with this with your clients and to explain to them the theory. Then I'm going to have a big section on what makes a good life purpose, because many people say they have a life purpose, they may even write it down, but when it comes to it, it's horrible for getting them where they want to go, right? It's not going to get them to the life purpose, it's not going to get them out of the situation they're in. Um, and so that's a big area that, that you have a room for growth with most clients. And then finally, I've got three methods of uh, well, three example methods that you can work with with your clients, so step-by-step -step methods to get them and yourselves in preparation to your life purpose. Um, so first step, theory. Um, okay, before we get really into this though, I just want to tell everybody that I kind of consider this to be a back and forth, so if anybody wants to butt in with questions or information that I think may, may be relevant or, or whatever discussion, you know, feel free to just do that anytime. I like to have a, a conversation going, so. Is it possible to improve people's well-being? It's a really widely debated thing among the, you know, the psycho, uh, psychology community. Um, and there is research both ways. But what this graph is here to show is by the probability weightings that the psychological process, so the way people are thinking, actually has an extremely profound impact on the actual well-being, both perceived and um, like perceived by themselves and objectively perceived by others. So the psychological processes are a key factor in what makes somebody successful. And that's why we need to focus on psychological processes. And one of the main parts of the psychological process which didn't fit into this is actually our perception of, of what events mean to us, right? There's no such thing as an objectively bad event. There's no such thing as an objectively good event. There's a famous story from the Tao where the farmer has his uh, son go into the forest and find a, a extra uh, horse that was just out there. And everyone says, oh, well, that's really great of you that you got this horse. And he says, maybe, maybe not. And then the son is breaking the horse, and he breaks his leg. And then everyone says, oh, it's a great misfortune that your son broke his leg. And the farmer says, well, maybe, maybe not. And the story goes on and on, but eventually the son gets, gets skipped over for going to war because his leg is broken. But then you know this and that happens. And so how we, we respond to situations is key to how successful we will be in life and our clients will be. Um, so this is a quote from one of the main research of, of this paper. While we can't change a person's family history or their life experiences, it is possible to help a person to change the way they think and to teach them positive coping strategies that can mitigate and reduce stress levels. So that's at the very least what we're doing with people, with our clients, is reducing their stress level by changing the way that they think and giving them positive coping strategies. So I'm going to be giving you a lot of different other resources as I go through here. And one that I really like is the Start With Why. And this is why I always start with life purpose. Um, and this book is great because the author goes through um, 10 or 15 extremely influential people who built their empire. Steve Jobs is probably the, the most uh, the, the spotlight of the book, but Martin Luther King, the Wright brothers, right? And what do they do differently than everyone else who failed? The hundreds of other computer companies that didn't become multi-billionaires, the hundreds of the people that were funded by the government but weren't able to fly when the Wright brothers can do it in their garage you know, without any exterior funding, they started with a reason why, a, a really compelling goal that got them there. Then they moved to the how, and then they moved to what they're doing. So often people start with, well, I'm going to do this, and then, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do it this way, and then, well, why am I doing it? Right? They invert the whole pyramid, the whole bullseye. So if we start with the why, with the life purpose, then people are 
have been, you know, historically shown to be much more effective. I spelled, I spelled Martin, apparently. <laughs> um, so purpose is essential at every stage. And this is really essential when working with somebody else because without purpose, they're not going to get up in the morning to do what they need to do. They're not going to take it seriously, right? There might be a burst of motivation to get them through the door, but unless we keep the eye on the goal, the chances of you having a successful outcome with a client is very, very low, right? I'm sure everyone's seen this in their own lives, right? Without a reason to put in the hard work that comes, but without a reason to stick with it, you're not going to stick with it. The other thing is there's a lot of doing out there, but not a lot of getting stuff done. And this is linked to a really famous Prater principle and sometimes called the 80-20. But the, that the most effective, like 80% of what actually makes us the money and gets us the, you know, what we're looking for and helps other people is really 20% of what we're doing. Right? And even within that, there's an 80-20 in there. So there's a small fraction, just like there's a small fraction of people that make the majority of money in the country and everyone else makes the rest, there's a small fraction of what we're doing that makes us effective. And so by having a purpose, you can match up your daily activities and your client's daily activities with what is actually getting you in that direction. Because as, uh, well, as Alice in Wonderland said, if you're going nowhere, you're definitely going to get there. Right? So another quote, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm a big believer that if you have a very clear vision of where you want to go, then the rest of it is much easier. Right? This is a man who he started working out under a soccer field in his hometown, and he would actually break in in the dead of winter and wrap towels around his hands so he could lift weights. You know, but he didn't see it as a sacrifice that he was in a, such a freezing cold room that he was worried that his hands were going to freeze to the weights he was using. He saw that as an opportunity to get ahead. Right? And so he was actually really excited about it. He was looking forward to going to the gym those days, where most of us would be like, you know, that's almost torture. And that's but, and he was doing it because he had these posters up in his room of these bodybuilders that he met and that he saw in movies as a kid. He said, I'm going to be one of them. And that's what got him to everything that he's done. You know, he's been an actor, he's been a politician, um, and it's always been clear goals. Every step along the way, people said, you can't do it. Right? But he said, I'm going to do it. And by having those pictures in his room, his vision ahead of him, he was willing to make this, take the steps that it made it work. Okay, so now here's the larger section, how to identify effective So broad thing, find something that's worth living for. It has to be an emotionally compelling thing to the person. And it, it could seem really simple. You know, it, it could be, I'm, I just want to you know, make this little bit of my world a better place, or I just want 10 people to remember me, or something. But it has to be psychologically uh, motivating to people. Um, so we're going to get into this a bit, bit more in depth. So this is a huge area where people, uh, I think, fail. And is even though it doesn't have to be a big dream, most people that I've met and coached with don't really respond to small dreams. Right? People are really psychologically motivated by big, out of this world dreams. Like Steve Jobs, I want to change the world with computers. Or, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I want people to know me around the world for my physique and, uh, you know, to be that person on the, the posters that other little boys are looking up to. All right? Saying, you know, I just want to make it through this month or I want to live in the normal house in the neighborhood, the slightly bigger house in the neighborhood. It might be a fine goal, but it's not, if it's not emotionally motivated today, it's not going to get there. And for most people, that isn't. Um, so safe dreams do not motivate you, or most people. So if it's not motivating, you got to go big. So in this phase of the dream building, it's great to just let everything go wild, you know, let uh, abandon caution, and just throw out seeds and see where it comes up. You, you may never guess what your life uh, purpose is. And for many people who are coaching, they probably have never guessed what their real life purpose is. They may have things that they're orbiting around that they think that's it. But it could be that, that you know, I, I've always wanted to be a dancer, but my parents poo-pooed it when I was six. And then that's been suppressed so deep that it could take many sessions to really get that out. So by narrowing in too much on their current career or what they've been doing in the past, you're likely to actually miss what the thing is that would really motivate them. And so a big tool for this is, is journaling. Yes? So you said you wanted to interact with me. I just yeah, please. Like our, uh, share something. The, when you said about your six and you wanted to be a dancer but your parents pooed it, mm -hmm. I just learned of a man who was uh, adopted from Korea and lived in a family where 
there was no impact. At three, started. Now he works for Disney as he creates these major things from video and sound, even though nobody else knew anything about music, but it was in him. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Just, yeah, it, isn't that a great mm -hmm. story? And it just fits with your thing. And he had to move to a big dream because he was so insecure being adopted and the only Asian person in a little teeny tiny town of either Wisconsin and Wisconsin or was it Minnesota. So you're saying by him going so big, it actually helped him get past this, his, what his fears were of where he was? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, thanks for, for chiming in on that. I, that's a great story. That might actually make it into the next version of this. <laughs> I'll connect you with the guy. Oh, really? Okay. Personally. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, thanks for, sorry, I, I get so into it sometimes, I'm just looking, yeah, I'm not looking around as much, but yeah. But yeah, everyone, raise your hand and do you need to get my attention. You can even yell at me if you need to. Um, <laughs> like Dave does, thank you, Dave. So uh, focus on what is important. Um, so a lot of times we get sidetracked with day-to-day -day stuff, with stuff that seems important, stuff that's other people's importance that they put on us. Um, and that is gonna be a major roadblock in actually getting to the success for you and your client. Um, thing that people, and especially in my line of work, that people have problems with is actually money. People are saying, well, I don't have the time, I don't have the money um, to get to where I'm going, to pay for what I want to do, to go to these classes. Uh, and that I find is a huge mistake. There's almost always room to minimize what you're currently doing and make room for what you want to do, right? People spend hundreds or thousands of dollars a month on stuff that if they really took the time to analyze and budget, they would probably say, well, I don't need a month on coffee, you know, I can at home. Or, you know, I could even, one big thing is downsizing a little bit. Like, if, if somebody's really in a tough spot, almost everyone's paying rent and utilities. And if it comes down to it, to really have a life goal that's worth, that's worth living for, then it, it might make sense to temporarily downsize that, maybe, you know, sell the car, get a little cheaper running car, and put yourself in a place where you can actually day-to-day -day take action, because taking action is where people are going to get results. There's so much talk out there and people that, that sounds like a great idea, I'd love to do that. Get people to take action through these goals and through very concrete steps and by putting them in a financial, psychological place where they can actually do it, then you know they're just gonna float away and keep doing what they're doing, just like most of us do, unfortunately. So in line with this, people a lot of times when they're talking about life goals are worried about their status in society and they're worried about the money. And that's a big roadblock. Because you never know what's going to make you successful. Just like, you know, your friend, a lot of parents would say, "Well, don't you know, don't waste time with instruments or music. You're not going to make money on that. Go be a Wall Street banker or something, right?" But when you are really passionate about something, that's when money comes to you. Because money comes from when you give value to other people. And so, whatever you have of value is what you need to be giving to people and figuring out how to make it a monetary thing, how to make it pay for the bills, right? So don't. It's a huge trap everyone gets into to say, "Well." this is a higher paying career, that's what I should do, right? And people have internalized this, so you may not recommend, uh, recommend it to people, they might not even think that they're following that path, but it gets internalized so much for children that we're likely, you're likely to encounter it with clients that you work with. All right, so the next thing is focus on goals, on life purpose, where you can constantly improve in that field. Um, yeah, okay, so that was in the, so constantly improving. Now, next big topic is giving something away. So life purpose where you're actually motivated to help other people for the purpose of helping other people is not only a good thing to do, it actually is much more effective, right? There's a, a study that shows that people are more likely to give their dogs their, med the, their medication on time than to themselves because people intrinsically care more about the people around them than they do about themselves. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, people are there to sacrifice and they're, they're willing to um, put themselves second to other people. But um, it's bad when we're trying to put ourselves and our clients ahead because they may not be doing what it takes to, to make themselves what they can be. And while it's unfortunate because that makes, you know, it leaves somebody at 40% or 20% of their maximum capabilities, so they're not really putting themselves in a place where they can help other people the maximum. Um, it's difficult to get that point across, like it doesn't emotionally resonate, which is why the life purpose needs to actually have a component of helping other people in it. That way, you know, I may not get up this morning for myself to be successful, but I may get up because I have a chance to help out somebody else today. 
Um, so compassion, and I just mentioned the, the, the dog thing, but um, fighting for other people is actually our biggest strength. Uh, there's another statistic that comes up where the people who won uh, the Victoria's Cross, which is basically the, the Medal of Honor for um, English people, or British people, the British Empire, almost all of them were older siblings, uh, families where the parents were either were not there or were somehow incapacitated, right? So the people who were able to make these heroic gestures, put themselves before other people, uh, were doing it because they had a really strong instinct to treat other people around them like younger siblings that they were protecting. So that's a really powerful mindset to get into, right? We're not other people's parents, we're not there to tell them what to do because we're smarter, but we are, maybe we know something a little more than them and we're their old, older siblings and they're, we're there to help. And that will get you through, you know, these, it's gotten these people through amazing things and it will get you through amazing things as well. Um, so focus hugely on what your special talents and interests are. Um, and this may take some development again, but everybody has a little bit of something different than everyone else. They have key parts of themselves that are potentially dormant and need development, but by focusing on that, you're very likely to find something, uh, a life purpose that your clients are actually gonna be successful with, right? There's always stuff that people just love doing that's naturally fun to them that isn't fun to everybody else. Um, you know, I'm a science and math guy, and most people, uh, that I used to tutor and a lot of people hate it, <laughs> right? But I was good at that, so I, you know, I focused on that and that was great. And there's other things that I dislike, you know? I, you could take me to a paint store and I'd be dead. I'd be bored in 15 minutes because I don't, I don't care about that stuff. But there's people I go with who are just so engrossed by all the different colors and the, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and all those mix and it's, it's out there for everyone to find for themselves. So last, or in this vein as well, uh, find things that you're proud of to show other people or that your clients are proud of to show other people. Um, it's hugely important that the, our clients define their own metric of success, right? Which is, if I you know, look back on today or this month or this year, was what I did, you know, not everything worked out the way I thought it would, but was that overall successful? Or on what scale from one to 10, how successful was that? And what can I do to get it more successful? Right, if we're not reviewing what we've done, if we're not improving ourselves, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you're really not gonna get anywhere, right? Because you, if you're just randomly trying things without having a direction to it, um, you're gonna be unsuccessful. It, you're just, you know, it's like, am I gonna win the lottery versus am I gonna build a business? You know, you may make, you may not fit, uh, succeed on every step of building a business, but as long as you succeed enough times, you're eventually gonna get there, as long as you're with it long enough. Um, so, in order to do that though, we can't operate on what society tells us is a success. We have to operate on what we tell ourselves is a success, on our metric of success of what we did today, being towards our goal or against our goal. So, making a world a better place. Like, the life goal, by the end of it, we should, it should leave everyone with a legacy that they feel like, this is what I've contributed to society and the world around me. Um, and then the third major area is reconnecting with nature. So I'm an often permaculturist, of course, so that's a big thing to me. But with everybody, the research has shown that even just the color green makes people more relaxed. But there's so many aspects of being in nature um, that make people feel less stress, it's like not just you know not just mentally but chemically in the body. Uh, it gets us to a much stronger place. And so by having nature as part of you know somehow mixing the life purpose that's a great way to get people that first jump and going uh, in the right direction so spending out times outdoors why do we need to do this I mentioned it makes us calmer um, people are way have a uh, larger ability to reflect on their past actions when they're in nature so this could be a tool for us as life coaches to somehow do an activity that gets us more in nature, whether it's in a room with a beautiful view or whether it is actually outdoors if when the weather permits. Um, but that could be a super powerful tool for us. You know, there's so many of us that are cave dwellers that live in th these walls that are, you know, maybe we have windows, but that's not necessarily being entirely outside. And the other thing is that we are being con constantly bombarded by electromagnetic radi radiation. And, you know, we don't 100% know what all that does to us, but we do know things like Wi-Fi from your computers um, makes people have a hard time sleeping, or, and it also makes REM sleep not as available, right? That's some of the little research that's been done. They've shown that there's significant effect on men's testosterone levels and um, <coughs> sperm count by just having a cell phone in your pocket for a couple hours, and this has been tested all over the world. 
So you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's probably millions of ways that this is affecting us that we just haven't had the time or inclination to research. So getting a little time away from that, you know, even if it's not your own phone, there's stuff everywhere. And then there's the power lines. So getting a little bit into nature can just give you that time to, to, to relax in your body, that time to recover. Um, uh, another little quote, the universe and the light of the stars come through me. So this is just to touch base on, there is a spiritual aspect to everybody. Whether, really? <laughs> well, it's a uh, pressing and I, it's just such a powerful quote as I, you probably agree because the spiritual aspect of everyone's life is there and um, you know, we're not, many of us are not part of religion anymore or you know, we're changing religions or that aspect of social society is, is minimized good and for the bad because people need a spiritual connection and so if that isn't client's life somehow, um, it, it makes sense to try to, to steer them in a direction where they can feel that, whether it's you know, just looking at the stars at night or whether it's a more organized type of religious experience. And now this one I think people forget a lot about is developing actual real skills that do things with your hands. Right? I mean, I'm a computer person, I do most of my work on the computer, but it's just so um, rewarding to actually be able to do something. And like it or not, people around you are actually going to take you more seriously if you have something visible that you can do that's a skill. Whether it's playing an instrument, building, you know, woodworking, writing nicely, um, uh, you know, pottery, almost anything. But developing new skills actually makes you feel better about yourself because you're getting positive feedback from people around you. Um, so I would encourage everybody to, to themselves and their clients, as you're doing now, constantly go to courses, read books, improve your value to society. Um, because you know, psychologically, we actually communicate how we feel about ourselves to other people, and they communicate it back. Right? So our posture, the way that our face moves, it's all subconscious psychologically broadcasting what we think our worth in society is to other people. And then people subconsciously are responding to that and it's broadcasting it back to you. So little things that you can do to make somebody's self-worth increase, even, you know, a pottery class is a huge step in the right direction because it magnifies. People are going to give you a little more self-worth back because you feel like you have worth. Then you're going to feel a little more worth there. And if you can spiral that up, that's how we're going to get people out of depression and out of these difficult situations. All right, so about five to ten minutes left. So I've, this is the start of the three methods. And so these are things I think that are going to be really valuable for you to use for yourself or on your clients. So in your handouts, I have a printout with all of the methods on it. Um, and I also have a link on the, in the handout in your book to uh, my website where you can download this in PDF form, which means you can copy paste it and put it in your own documents or expand upon it. Um, I didn't have room to have a full write-in section because I just wanted to get it on one sheet to make it a little more convenient. So you can split that up and have either sections for your clients to write below or just hand it to them and uh, write it yourself. But So I'm going to go through where I got these. Uh, these are all come with references as well uh, so that you can build up your credentials and your uh, list of, of you know, your bibliography with your clients. And it's basically my idea with this is that's kind of a smorgasbord. So you might pick a little bit out of one method or you might say, okay, method two works better for this person um, because this is that client's interest versus method one and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm going to start by going through the different methods step by step. So method one, this is what I call the Pavlina method uh, by life coach, blogger Steve Pavlina. Um, so this is from his website and this is the quickest um, and probably most directly effective one. Now it, it takes a bit of commitment on the, the part of the person doing it to get there. Um, but I think it's a great way to start if you have somebody that's really committed to the process. Um, and, and that's the key. The key with this thing is you're going to be doing this process for as long as it takes. And have setting an intention before you go in that I'm not getting up until I've found my life purpose will make it happen. Right? It, that's the difference between it being successful and not being successful. Because if you go in the mindset, well, I'm going to try this for 30 minutes, it doesn't work, I'm just going to leave. You're going to sit there for 30 minutes, it's not going to work, and then you're going to leave. So, because this is all about pulling out stuff from your subconscious and from your deeper psychology. So, method, open up a writing, way of writing, uh, word processor, sheet of paper, whatever they're comfortable with. Right on the top, what is my true life purpose? Just write whatever pops in your head as an answer. It doesn't have to be a sentence, it doesn't have to be anything, it could be a paragraph. Whatever they feel like writing, just the first thing that comes up, write it down. Right? Then do that again and again and again. Keep writing the stuff that comes to your head as answers. As quickly as you can, try not to filter it. There's going to be a little filtering there, but just put it directly on the paper 
and you know you've gotten there when it makes you cry, right? Or you at least get that emotion welling up, right? It's amazingly effective, this method is, and it can be quite short, um, but if it takes three hours, if it takes four hours, like, be, be prepared to, <laughs> your subconscious is almost like an unruly child, and you've got to sit there with, with loving presence and wait until it, it's done throwing a tantrum. And so it, it, take, it might take as long as it takes, but as long as you are willing and your client is willing to put in that, that commitment up front and to have that discipline, then it's an absolutely amazing method. Okay, so this me method is probably the exact opposite. This is more the intellectual, like let's build it up um, type of method. So this may be a good way to, to, to lead in with clients that are not necessarily as super on board with method one. Um, or you know that type of working. So this comes from a book called Work Energy, which actually came out about a month ago, um, and it's it's more on the like the productivity business management type side. And it's it's an amazing book. I recommend it. Um, there's a link on the the sheet as well. But it it's a the goal of it is to help people get from where they're not as productive as they want to be in the business, in the workplace, and in life to figuring out what it is about them that can make them super productive. Uh, so this is just one small segment from that book, but. Um, it's, so it's a question and answer, series of question and answers. The first one is, when you come up with something to play with your kids, what do you do? So this may need to be adjusted if the person is single, um, but you know, with your family, with people that they like, with their pets, whatever it is, uh, this is a really good way. Oops, I went. Anyway, so this is a good way to to look into what. When people, what people do when they don't feel like they're being judged or we're watching them gives you a big insight to what uh, would actually make them tick. Right? So this can be adjusted any way like that. You know, what vacations do you want to go on? What do you dream of your kids becoming even if you don't have kids yet? What would you be really happy if your kids became? Because that is more about what you want to become rather than what your kids should be, right? In many cases. Um, so you all that. Uh, what unique life experiences have you had that forced learn certain traits. So this is looking into your history. Um, whatever situations are you really pr proud about? What situation made you sad in the past? Um, you know, how is, do you having siblings, has that affected you? Um, and then question three, who is someone who you loved and whose personality other people has found off-putting? So this is really cool because it has that uh, contrarian element to it. Uh, somebody that you loved but other people wouldn't necessarily. So it, it puts a lot of uh, a spotlight on what the differences between you and what you perceive other people's perceptions to be. So it's not even really about what other people are, are you know, would perceive it to be. It's what the client thinks other people would perceive about it. Um, and this gets in the whole psychological projection aspect, which I'm, you probably are all familiar with. Uh, basically, you know, we see in other people what we see, in, what we feel about ourselves, but we're not ready to admit. All right. <laughs> huh. Open sesame. All right. Do we have an extra packet somewhere? Yeah. I'll just go off the sheet. <clears throat> All right. So. So that was question three. Uh, four, what would a perfect work day look like in your current job? So now this is getting more towards the, the basic aspect, but so much of what we feel about ourselves comes from our profession. So g getting people's profession into it is an is a important thing to do, right? You can look at that historically, how many people's names are based off what their great, great, great grandparents did, right? Like my last name is Schwartz Black, has to do with blacksmithing. There's a ton of that out there. And in older societies, people weren't even necessarily given a last name. They were just called by what their role in the village was. So people need to, uh, their life purpose needs to incorporate a bit of um, what their role in society is. And that's what we're talking about, giving back, but, and the, your perception to other people. So linking into your, their profession is, is key to that. Um, five, what do you intentionally do to impress other people? That's a great question. You know, if that, that lies, uh, lights up so much about the inner personality. So uh, just putting that out there is gonna probably leave you to interesting life coaching uh, 
points in that in the session. Six, what character trait are you proud of in yourself? So focus on not only what you want to change, but what the client is already good at and is already interested, um, well, is already proud of in their capabilities, because that's a great launching point to spread that out to the rest of the life. Um, seven, when you're growing up, what was something hard to do, but which you enjoyed working on? So harking back to the everyone has their own special you know, things that they like to do, their own like God-given, if you will, uh, traits. Uh, ferreting those out is super powerful to get people motivated, interested, and going. Um, so then, and there's a twist at the end, after you've done that to yourself or to the, your client, have them get somebody significant to them, a spouse, a friend, somebody that they really trust, to answer those same questions about the person, right? So. Um, Ask them, you know, what if Tim is your client? Then you ask Tim's friend, what does Tim do with his kids? What is, you know, what is Tim's uh, character traits that you think he's proud of? Type of, so and that is a really interesting way to sh to shine a mirror on what other people actually think about the client because usually when people are in in need of um, improvement and are seeking out help, it's because they have some kind of disconnect with the people around them, and so. That can also not only give you fodder to work with because you're seeing them through the, the eyes of somebody that knows them well, but also it, it can reflect back to your client, um, can be used to show them actually what people do think about them and maybe get them a little more aligned with the, the reality of the situation. Okay, and then method three is the psychosynthesis method. Real quick, psychosynthesis, uh, excuse me, psychosynthesis is an older from the 1965-ish um, psychological method, um, and it, it kind of, it gets, it comes in and out of fashion, but it's something that I've always really enjoyed. So there's a nice older book can get used about it that has the condensed writing called Psychosynthesis. Um, and uh, so this is borrowed, not directly from, from them, but based on their, their conception of how human psychology works. And the reason why I really like their method is because it's not just about um, helping people that have you know, a condition. It's their main focus is actually getting people from, let's say, average to exceptional. So they're the other half of that, that, uh, the, the puzzle not just getting people from dysfunctional to functional, but functional to super functional. And so they're, unfortunately, I don't have the graphic, but um, I, their conception of the human psychology is that there's three levels of unconsciousness. So we have the consciousness in the center, and then around us we have a lower, a middle, and a higher subconsciousness. And all of these are essentially like completely different people in a way that are all part of us, and they have different wants, and they have different ways of perceiving the world. And so the psychosynthesis member uh, method is we're going to take a paper and divide it into three sections for the three levels of subconscious, and then let your client free associate um, with the intention of finding the best imaginable outcomes on each level. So this is basically setting goal setting or purpose setting through free association, but from the aspect of my lowest level, my middle level, and my highest level. So you'll have to go to the book if you want a more fuller uh, uh, or maybe take one of our you know, longer courses, which I would get into a lot more. But in the short, the lower is kind of our base psychological needs, you know, like enjoyment, food, you know, sex, that type of stuff. Um, in the middle is more of our intellectual understanding. So kind of like what most people would call ego um, more directly. So like direct shows of value from people around us, um, uh, power, that that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily. It's it takes a little explanation because it's not necessarily a negative thing, right? We and most of a, a lot of psychological literature or new agey type literature, that stuff is is seen as the enemy and it's the shadow side. And we're trying to get rid of it. Um, now that may or may not be possible, but for most of us, there's part of it there. And so the, a successful life goal is actually going to have to incorporate that side in it, right? So we we like to plan ourselves as being the martyr, uh, but if we're but those kind of goals fail, so we need to incorporate our, you know, our little child into that as well. What's the name of the book? Psychosynthesis, a collection of writings. I have the link um, on the paper actually, so you can just go to Amazon and see it from there. But and then, so the top level is the actual, like what we most people think about themselves, like the the saint aspect of it, you know, the giving part of you, um, and th that doesn't need too much explanation because that's what a lot of people plan for anyway. And then finally, go through all three segments after you've written, you know, filled up the page with all of your free association of things that you would like as a life goal, and then see if you can find a vein that runs all, all through it, something that is, you know, like a pillar where this is part of it, and this is part of it, and this is part of it, and the whole goal extends through all three levels. So, 
that's the three uh, the three methods. So, is there any um, discussion about that? Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Danny.